Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Greetings. I, uh, yesterday I was, yesterday I was reading a a, a book to uh, Malcolm called The Magic School Bus. Has anybody heard of this show? The this it's a TV show. It's also a book. You know, The Magic School Bus. And uh, there was this scene where they're on the magic school bus, and the magic school bus has this video up of a place that the that the uh, students want to go to. And then all of a sudden, this hand comes forward, like a mechanical hand, and pushes them into the screen, and they go into that place. <laughs> and that, you know, it's kind of like what I want to do right now. I just, you know, either one, either I go like into the screen and appear on the other side or with you guys, or you guys come this direction and you can, you can be in my little Buddha hall here in Iowa, just like that. We just, just get a little closer. <laughs> <laughs> There's a pop. Um, I'm going to, let's see, am I, uh, do I have co-host capacity here? All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, George, thanks for your chanting voice this this morning. Sounds great. Um, and you know, this chanting is so it's so good. It's so good for our practice. It just you, we we learn to project our voice. So I would encourage you, even if you don't feel uh, if you feel anxious about doing something like that, I would still encourage you to practice it. It's a wonderful practice and. Uh, um, I love to hear the diversity of voices that are that are present at, at uh, Nebraska Zen Center. You don't have to have any special qualifications, and I will definitely work with any of you who choose to do that. All right, what I want to do, um, what I would like to share, just kind of two things today. One is the uh, a little some photos from my recent trip to Zenshuji to the. Uh, last weekend, last weekend, uh, Jisho, Malcolm, and I were at Zenshuji to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Soto Zen in the United States. It was a huge, huge occasion, a big event that's been uh, at, at over a year in the planning. If you can imagine 100 years of this practice that we're doing in the United States. And of course, this was brought by Japanese, not just Katagiri Roshi, not just Suzuki Roshi, not just Mayazumi Roshi, but Japanese teachers that we have never heard of. We don't, we don't know their names. Most of us don't know their names because they didn't write anything in English and they were serving the Japanese American community. But Zenshuji is the very first temple, Soto Zen temple, to, to appear not in the United States, but on the North American continent. Because there are actually temples that were, that were made a little bit earlier in Hawaii. So it's a, in, in either case, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting thing that's happened in the United States. So you have a, a Japanese community, a Japanese American community, first generation, second generation needing a uh, desiring a temple where they can do their do their practice. So uh, I want to share some photos. The, the Zenshuji was established in Los Angeles in Japantown. Japantown has radically changed over the past several decades. Uh, there's less Japan in Japantown these days, but still there's a lot of vestiges in it. And Zenshuji is one of those. So I'm going to show you some photos from, from the event itself and uh, give you a sense of maybe this, this particular temple. So I'm assuming you guys can see my screen. Let me know if otherwise. And please do come closer to the screen if you need to. There's going to be some uh, things here that you'll need to read. So I'd encourage you, yeah, come come closer to the screen. Seriously, you won't pop in. <laughs> so this is actually just an uh, an image of Zen Shuji that I pulled off of the internet. But this is the 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 front of it. 
it's not easy, so easy to see. It's a little bit blurry, but I, I want to take us inside for a moment. This is the altar. This is a photo I took at the event itself. And uh, look at that altar. To me, this is this is a really this is a typical Soto Zen altar. It's by no means simple. <laughs> I think we have this idea that Zen is sparse and uh, how do I say, like um, simple, simplistic. But if you look at this altar, you can see the ornateness of the, alt the altar itself. You see these very ornate candle holders. Uh, this, this space here is where the incense is. Look at the, the size of that incense holder, very large. There's offerings of fruit on the altar. Up, uh, it's a tiered altar, so there's there's levels to it. This red, this is this red uh, thing here in the back is the lacquered tray, which we have one of at uh, Nebraska Zen Center. You can see the flowers on either side. Another set of um, oh no, I'm sorry. Then there's there's uh, there are flowers in the background. These are. I hate to say, it, but fake flowers in the background. And then up here is a plaque like the one that we have for Nonan. And this one is for Kazan Joking. So Kazan Joking, along with Dogen Zenji, are the two are considered the two founders of Soto Zen. And we're coming up to the 700th anniversary of Kazan Zenji this uh, next year. And so in combination with the, the 100th anniversary of Soto Zen in, in, in America was the uh, 700th anniversary of preliminary, preliminary ceremonies for the 700th anniversary of Kazan Joking. And so the scroll behind, this is called an Ihai. It's a plaque and it basically contains uh, Kazan Zenji's name on the plaque. And behind him is a scroll with an image of Kazan Zenji. And it's actually covering the Buddha image, the Buddha statue, which is further behind that image. But you can see like all of the, the, the various cloths here covering the altar, covering the, the lacquered wood. This is typical of Soto Zen temples. And then over here on this side, the um, uh, the canopy there, you can, you can just barely see it over here, this up, up higher, a little bit higher, but these, this is the canopy, uh, looking down and then the red curtain behind, behind the altar. Right. So, so they, they really go all out. Now, uh, what you see here is a, uh, this is a monument that was made especially for the 100th anniversary of Soto Zen. The Chinese character here reads Zen Shu Ji, Zen Shu Ji. And on the opposite side are the names of all of the people that were uh, responsible for uh, creating and maintaining Zen Shu Ji, the, the, not just the priests that founded it, but also the donors that uh, helped to create it. Um, and pictured here are all the names, are, are names of the people that are actually found on the back of it that are still living. Uh, so let me introduce you to, let me introduce you to some of the, the main figures at this event. Um, this is Aki Baroshi. Aki Baroshi is the Bishop of North America. He's also a uh, teacher of Jisho, uh, my partner. And uh, and has several uh, student American students. This is um, uh, uh, Kojima Kojima Sensei. He is the present abbot of Zen Shuji. So he was of course um, pictured here. Uh, behind him is Daigaku Rume. He's a uh, he's one of my teachers and um, a a. Uh, he was the former, prior to Akibaroshi, uh, Daigaku was the Bishop of North America. And he took that position for about five years. He lived at, he lived very close to Zen Shuji and was their minister for five years. Um, 
this here is John Lang. He's a he he was a a minister at Zen Shuji also for some time before moving to Hawaii, where he now teaches. Um, I don't know personally the other people in this photo. Uh, I could tell you this man here with he was the he was the um, efficient at this particular unveiling of the monument there. He was the efficient at that event. Um, very fluent in English, uh, very surprisingly so, and, and uh, breath, you know, just wonderful, a wonderful uh, personality. Now, these folks behind Akiba Roshi and the efficient are the descendants of the founder of Zen Shuji. They're his grandchildren and great grandchildren, if you can believe that. They're his grandchildren and great grandchildren, these folks back here and this, this man back here. Uh, so they were also present, obviously. And then there's some other uh, Japanese, uh, uh, Japanese priests that came from, come, came from Japan, uh, I believe Sojiji or the Soto Shu to be present uh, and to uh, be a part of the ceremony. So this particular piece of the ceremony is just one small piece. It took place outside. Um, a part of the a part of the hundredth uh, anniversary included a panel discussion of the uh, a project that's been going on for about a, at least a decade, maybe maybe almost two decades. Um, a, a translation project that has finally come to completion. It's a huge, it was a huge undertaking. Taking, and one of the main translators of, of this project, Soto Zen text project, is Carl Biefeld. Um, and to give you a little bit of background, there are several translations out there of the Shobo Genzo. There are several translations of the Shobo Genzo. Um, one of them that uh, I use is Kaz Tanahashi's Shobo Genzo, and there's others as well. And the Soto Shu in Japan decided that we needed a Soto Shu version of the Shobo Genzo, a Soto, a Soto Shu translation of it. And this is not because the other translations are somehow deficient or um, not as good. Actually, they're quite good. Um, but the the scholarship the level of scholarship and the notes that are included in this show shobo genzo translation are extensive from what i understand i haven't seen it yet but i'm excited to get my hands on it at some point but um one of the one of the gifts of this particular translation is that it has it is uh replete with notes of a lot of the uh, maybe more enigmatic aspects of shobo genzo so there was a there was a uh, panel discussion of this event of the of this new translation that was just recently published and it's it's going to be hard to um, come by because it's 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 fairly expensive right now. I'm talking in, in the it's like four hundred dollars to to purchase the show Genzo. So it's part of the reason. Now they're going to be uh, giving it to Hawaii University Press to to publish again and the price will come down but it's going to be probably around 250 300 dollars once it's done because it's i want to say like seven or eight volumes that's how extent extensive it is so um now these are some folks that were part of the translation project namely carl biefeld and uh from soto shu seijun ishi roshi who's also a scholar a japanese scholar and the other folks that you see up here were were people um, that are mainly that are um, American priest practitioners. Ho Jean Kimmel is from Zen Mountain Monastery in New York. Uh, Cohen Franz is from Nova Scotia in Canada. Shinshu Roberts is in uh, California. Um, the name of her temple escapes me at present. And then Kokyo Henkel is a uh, uh, Dharma heir uh, of Reb Anderson in the Suzuki Roshi lineage there, as is Shinshu Roberts. Uh, Hojin Kimmel was a, uh, uh, 
a student of, of John Dido Lori and the Mayazumi Roshi lineage there. So they had a really interesting conversation, asked questions, made comments about the Shobogenzo uh, recent translation. And here you see Carl Biefeld uh, offering a, a talk about what he had been up to with regards to this project over the past couple of decades. Really his life, I would say his life work. And uh, he's translated a lot, of a lot of things. And one of the things that I think you would find very interesting to read as a Sangha is the uh, Dogen's Manuals of Zen Meditation. It's, it's an absolutely fascinating read about how Dogen Zenji really copied a, a previous Zen manual on how to do meditation. And he, he made, made some subtle changes to it. Uh, not huge changes, but some subtle changes. And, and Carl Biefeld in this book, uh, it, was, it was published uh, a number of years ago, I wanna say at least 20 years ago, maybe longer, where he, um, he com makes comparisons with earlier Zen, Zen instructions for, for meditation and Zazen. And I think it's an interesting read. So if any of you are interested in that, I would encourage it. Um, here's inside of Zen Shuji. This is uh, the ceiling, what the ceiling looked like. This is not typical there. They did this especially for the 100th anniversary, but you could see there they made over, they made some 6,000 cranes for this event. And they strung them up onto the, uh, as part of the ceiling. And you can see these lanterns as well. So it, it really had a magical feeling there inside the inside the temple. And this was actually before there was a full audience of people. So this is pictured mostly the the priests that were present at this time. Uh, but a lot of other people, a lot of other people, basically this was a full full room when everybody actually came. But I wanted to take a photo so you could see the, you know, you can see pews here. And this was a an attempt by the Japanese American community to adapt Soto Zen to American culture. And so part of part of what they did to do that, and remember that this is this was taking place during the height of of discrimination towards Japanese Americans. That, that discrimination still persists in, in America, but they were attempting to adapt to American culture by putting pews into the temple. And so you can see that here. Over here on the left is um, women uh, practicing what's called baika, which is the uh, Soto Zen forms of hymn, hymns. And so we were singing hymns while we were doing ceremonies, and it was quite beautiful. So if you think that uh, Soto Zen is just about like this monotone singing that is all esoteric and wisdom oriented, you really have to think again, because there is a total other element to it that um, is maybe considered softer. Uh, uh, the, the sounds that were coming out of the of those instruments was just just magical, just magical. And we were singing in various notes, not just one note. And um, and then another big at the end of the at the end of the ceremony, we went to a uh, to celebrate at a hotel in a in a uh, large room there near Japantown, and part of it was uh, featured taiko drumming. So you can see a, a masked a masked man wearing a, a demon like um, headdress doing taiko. That this was just one feature of it, but. These, they, there was just, they had children doing taiko, they were taiko drummers from Zen Shuji doing the taiko drumming. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, women and men doing the taiko drumming too, but it was quite an impressive group of people and wonderful sounds coming out of those drums, very high spirited. This was the, uh, the hall that, it, that, that our uh, banquet took place in. So that you see all the bald headed ones as well as uh, members of Zen Shuji. And this is only half of the room 
this is probably about half of the room. There's a whole other section of people to the left here that is not pictured. So that this is the um, it's kind of the first part of what I wanted to wanted to share about this this uh, this morning, just to give you a sense of what I've been up to, what I've been doing. This just happened a few days ago, or let me say a week ago. So it's quite a big thing, and and wanted to introduce you to that. All right, that's I realize that's a lot. Um, before I go on to the part two of what I wanted to share today, I wanted to pause there and see if there was any any questions or comments that can come up for you guys. Um, I have one: Is taiko drumming a particularly uh, Buddhist or Zen thing, or is it Japanese in general? I think it's it's hard to separate them because the drumming has been incorporated into into Zen practice right from the beginning. You, the drum signaled meal times, it signaled time in a monastery, and it was also part of Japanese culture too. And certainly there's the the Zen, I mean, one temple, Sozenji in, in Los Angeles, there's several Soto Zen temples in Los Angeles. Uh, you can imagine it's just such a dense population. And one temp, one of those temples, uh, Sozenji, the previous minister who who passed away a couple of years ago now, um, uh, Tom Kurai, he dedicated his entire mission almost to uh, to to taiko drumming. Mm -hmm. He had an entourage of of uh, of members at at Sozenji and non-members at Sozenji who performed taiko. That was his that was his main role as a priest. So he centered taiko drumming. He would do performances live. He would do performances and for very large audiences. He would also um, go into hospitals to the behavioral health and have people there practicing drum. I mean, you can imagine the pent up energy and anger and anxiety within a mental health unit in a hospital and how much drumming could release some of that anger and anxiety by, you know, pound on the drum, make some, make some sound. So that was his, um, that was his whole mission. And Reverend Karai even came to um, Mount Equity Zendo where I trained and he offered a couple, couple of different occasions. My teacher wanted us to learn taiko drumming. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful practice. It's a, it's, it's one of the practices I think that we could call Zen practice of many a, along with flower arrangement, calligraphy, um, uh, 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 ringing the bells, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a, I have a general question. Um, do you have, do you have a sense of the prevalence of Soto Zen in the United States relative to Linzai or Shingon? Or other traditions that have uh, yeah, I have a little bit of a sense of that. So yeah, that's a, like a contextual question. I think it's it's good to know the con. You know, the, what's the what's the geographic context? Right, almost right next to Zen Shuji is a Shingon temple. Actually, um, there's an American that has been practicing there as well. I know the American that's been practicing there. I don't think they I don't get a sense that there's a very large uh, non Asian community, uh, a part of that particular Shingon temple. And I'm not aware of a lot of uh, non Asians practicing within the Shingon tradition, not that they're absent, but um, in the world that I circle in um, Shingon has been less um missionizing in terms of bringing buddhism to the non-asian community uh, i think soto zen has been more so for some reason uh got got more attention there it, it might be partly suzuki shinru roshi being in san francisco at the height of the 1960s when all of these hippies in San Francisco converged on the Zen temple that was there and wanted to study under Shinru Suzuki and they were impressed by ideas of, of enlightenment and that kind of thing. So that may have been a part of the reason for that. I, I don't know. But um, 
with regards to Rinzai, I think Rinzai is a formidable, formidable presence within the United States, both within the Japanese tradition, the Chinese tradition, and the Korean tradition. The Rinzai school of, of Zen is, is quite formidable, and maybe even um, either on par with Soto Zen or even more, more popular than, than Soto Zen in the United States. Uh, where, and this is in contrast to Japan, where the Rinzai school is actually less popular than the Soto school. There's far more Soto Zen temples than there are Rinzai temples, because uh, my understanding is historically Soto Zen was more about the uh, it was more about in Japan anyways, missionizing to the to the com more of the common people, the farmers, the merchants. Whereas Rinzai Zen was more about uh, uh, the upper class, the warrior class, the the, the samurai, the um, the aristoc aristocracy. Uh, whereas Soto Zen was more for the common folk, and so it be, it became more popular, especially with Keizan Jokin, three four generations after Dogen. Dogen's Zen was quite small, and, and uh, it really became popular, popularized with Keizan Zenji, not Dogen Zenji. But when, uh, you know, over the past 100 years, 100 years or so, or so since Buddhism has been migrating to North America, you've got, um, you know, D.T. Suzuki, the scholar, was very also influential because he was a Rin, he was a practitioner of Rinzai Zen, and um, you don't see much comparison in his writings and his talks between Rinzai and Soto. He doesn't make a clear distinction there, and a lot of people simply assume that what he says applies to all of the different schools of Zen, Soto included. Um, there's an emphasis, for example, on an enlightenment or satori experience. And that's not the case in Soto Zen. We don't emphasize that. It's not that it's absent, but it's not, um, it's not, it, it, we, we, we uh, work with that concept quite a bit differently than the Rinzai school. And that's a whole nother, you know, there's a whole another set of differences. But D.T. Suzuki really popularized, I think. He, he did a lot to uh, popularize Rinzai Zen. And, and I think that's part of the reason why Rinzai Zen is, is equally popular, if not more popular than Soto in the United States. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, let me, um, let me continue here. I, I, uh, I want to share some other things. Just a little bit of shift. Now, what I'd like to do is share a little bit from uh, Dogen's Zui Monkey. Uh, this was something I shared with you all uh, a little bit last time I was when I was there in person. Uh, I, and I want to I want to do a, a brief contrast between the Zui Monkey and the Shobo Genzo. Sho, so Zui Monkey is actually called Shobo Genzo Zui Monkey. Shobo Genzo is the Shobo Genzo. Shobo Genzo and Zui Monkey are not the same thing. Uh, so we're going to do a little, I'll do a little contrast with, with them. And then I want to pick up on one point within the Zui Monkey and, and just kind of highlight that one point for us. Take away. All right, so I'm going to uh, share my screen again. And what I, what I want to focus on here is this uh, one theme. There's several themes within Zui Monkey, but one of the themes within Zui Monkey is giving up worldly sentiments and giving up worldly sentiments all right so dogen zenji says um and i'm going to compare this 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 zui monkey with shobo genzo just to give you a sense of the differences and the span of dogen's writings it's quite different because most of us see dogen as very esoteric, very philosophical, very hard to understand. But if you read his Zui Monkey, you'll get a completely different view of Dogen and that he wasn't so difficult to understand. All right, so he says here in this one saying, he says, 
being concerned about your worldly reputation regarding speech and behavior, refraining from doing evil because people will think ill of you, or doing good at every opportunity because people respect you as a Buddhist practitioner, what do you think? What do you think he's going to say here? No. <laughs> you are still being moved by worldly sentiments. Exactly. No. Don't do that. Right? Don't don't do that. He's basically saying, be careful about doing this. Be careful about your, your intentions in practice. And I, and I want to point out here that this is a far cry from the idea that Zen is about just doing whatever you feel like and non-duality and that kind of thing, right? Dogen has some really clear prescriptions here about how to live and what to do. But if you don't read Zui Monkey first, you'll think otherwise, because let's look at, let's look at Genjo Koan, highly esoteric, way more philosophical. He says, when all dharmas are the Buddha Dharma, there is delusion and realization, practice, life and death, Buddhas and living beings. This is, this is, this is a totally different way of writing than the Zui Monkey, than, than what appears in the Zui Monkey. And it requires a lot more in-depth unpacking. So we've got these two kinds of writings from Dogen that appear. One is in the Zui Monkey, and the other is the Shobo Genzo. In this case, I'm just choosing Genjo Koan as, as one fascicle within the uh, over 90 fascicles of the Shobo Genzo. This is just one fascicle. Zui Monkey is more about the, what we call the relative dimension. The Shobo Genzo is more about the absolute. Right. So relative meaning the world of comparison, the world of this and that, of high and low, of good and bad, of right and wrong. The absolute dimension is this dimension where there is no such distinctions. OK, Zui Monkey is directional. It's saying do it this way, practice in such a way. Whereas Shobo Genzo is it's not that it's not directional but there's much less of a direction apparent when you read it. In a sense, it's non-directive. It's simply stating reality as it is through words. So those of us who think that words are um, excessive, I mean, we, we, they, they can be. And we just chanted the Faith in Mind um, poem where it talks about the, the uh, limits of words. But do not think that by forsaking words, you're going to capture the essence of Zen. That's just a bunch of BS. There are people who think that you can just be silent and not talk anything about Zen or say anything about Zen, and they think that they're, they're actually doing the real practice. And that cannot be further from the truth. Zen is not about being quiet. Zen is not about um, not stating anything, not talking about practice. There may be times when we do that, but um, we have to study the writings of Zen masters. We, we need to talk about Zen in our life uh, amongst us practitioners. It's, it, that's to our benefit. We need to study and develop our own language around uh, Zen terminology. We need to study Zen terminology because this creates the world. Language creates the world. As much as Zen says that we need to let go of language. We also need to hold on to it. Uh, it's creating our world. Okay. Going back to this, Zui Monkey is, is usually not directly about orienting the mind in Zazen. There may be encouragement to do Zazen in Zui Monkey, but it's, it's um, if you want to know how to kind of open your mind in Zazen, you're going to find a lot more about that in Shobo Genzo. Uh, it's often, it's usually, and some, some, some teachers will say that every fascicle in the Shobo Genzo is basically pointing to Zazen in some form or another. Uh, you know, some would argue that that's not the case. Some would argue that that is. But in any case, Zui Monkey 
is um, less about, I would suggest it's less about what to do in Zazen and more about how to live your life in general. It's fairly dualistic in its, in, in, uh, its appearance, whereas Shobogenzo, for the most part, is, is non-dualistic. Zui Monkey, relevant to everyone, whether they practice or not, whether they're Buddhist or not, uh, whether they sit Zazen or not. Uh, whereas Shobogenzo is, is more relevant for those of us who have kind of dedicated our, ourselves to practicing Zazen. Uh, or studying the Buddha Dharma. The two are interrelated, of course. Zui Monkey is more practical advice, whereas Shobo Genzo is more philosophical and requires a lot more interpretation. Okay, so that's just to give you a sense of the some of the differences between Dogen's writings and his writing style. Zui Monkey is actually not Dogen's writing. They're the recorded sayings of Dogen recorded by his, his student Kounejo. So it's not actually writings of Dogen. They're, they're what he actually said, according to Kounejo. So let's get back to the Zui Monkey and, and kind of chew on, on this one like practical advice. What do we do? What do we do for practice? And Dogen Zenji says, he says, a student of the way must abandon human sentiments. What does he mean by human sentiments? Thoughts and emotions based on egocentricity, discrimination, and preference, like we just chanted in the faith and mind. Give up our preferences, right? But, you know, here's a question I want to ask us, just to think about. You don't have to answer it, but are preferences abandonable? I don't think that's what we're at being asked to do when Dogen Zenji says, give up preferences. Just don't think you don't think you can have zero preferences. That's not realistic. If you're given a job to do, you're, you're going to have a preference. You're going to either like it or not like it. If you're given, say, for example, uh, a brush to clean the, a shitty toilet, you're going to have a preference doing that job. And if you think otherwise, you're actually deluding yourself. So we have to be careful about preferences. It's impossible not to prefer one thing over the other. And at the same time, Zen says, give them up. All right. So, but we need to be wise about this. We need to be wise about when we hear uh, chants or teachers say, give up preferences. All right, let's get back to the Zui Monkey. Dogen, what you think is good or what others think is good is not always good. Therefore, forget others' views. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I don't know, if, I don't know about you, but this is like, for me, this is like jumping into a cold pool on a hot summer day when I, when I read this. What you think is good or what others think is good is not always good. Therefore, forget others' views. Ah. <laughs> Cast aside your own mind and follow the teachings of the Buddha. So let me just ask you here. Think about a time where you have done something where you thought you were following your conscience, but others thought what you did was bad. Right? You felt, you know, you felt, you know, honestly, you thought you were doing something very good. You're following your conscious, you're following the way of the Buddha, but you got some flack from others, maybe, uh, maybe from your parents, maybe from your family. Uh, maybe it was from your teacher. Right. And what, did, what were some of the things that you felt? Maybe it was from a trusted friend. But what were the, some of the things were, that you felt? Maybe betrayal. Uh, maybe embarrassment, maybe frustration, anger, anxiety, that you were possibly upsetting somebody that you really admire. Maybe it was your, your boss. Right? What are the feelings that had come up when what you thought you were doing is good, and maybe you do feel that was good, 
Maybe you know that it was the right thing to do. Maybe you know you have a real deep sense that it was a part of carrying out the Dharma. But you got critiqued, you got criticized for it. You got, you got uh, even maybe your reputation came to be at stake because of something good that you did. Right? This is a real thing, and I'm sure you guys can think of examples in your own life where you felt your reputation was now at stake because you did something that others, my, uh, that through the eyes of other people, they thought was bad or wrong. And Dogen says, therefore, forget others' views. Cast aside your own mind and follow the teachings of the Buddha. Even though your body suffers and your mind is in distress, resolve to abandon body and mind and practice what the Buddha's practice, even if it's painful or causes you distress. This is a far cry from ideas many of us come to practice with at a Zen temple where we want to have peace of mind and we're even expecting that peace of mind. That if we don't have peace in our minds, we must not be practicing correctly. Well, that, that's a very narrow interpretation of what practice is. Practice is there for us even in the difficult moments. Even in the difficult, that's when we really have to practice, not when everything's going fine and good and dandy and we're all happy and peaceful. That's great if you feel that way. But when we come to the Zen temple, we might be in great distress. We have to know that others at the temple might be in great distress. And this is how we develop compassion for others. When we, when we, when we can see that, every, I mean, look around you. There may be some people there in this room today that feel distress about their life in some way. And Dogen saying, practice. This is, this is where we have to practice. Right now, right here, in the middle of this. No. So I'm going to stop there with the sharing. So a couple of things that I want to um, bring up here. So how do we how do we deal with with this? What are ways that we can deal with it? And I want to suggest uh, I want to suggest three things. Three things. When we feel judged, when we feel judged by by others in some way. And we're feeling, maybe we feel shame, anxiety, anger, all of those feelings might come up for us. Many of us are attracted to Zen in the first place because of this idea of non-judgmental awareness. Right? And yet it continues to crop up. If we're not judging ourselves or really highly critical, many Zen students are very highly critical of their own practice. Or we meet people that are very critical of us. Right? So, so how do we deal with this? And I want to say there's three things that I can think of as strategies. The first one, mindfulness of the body. The practice body awareness. This is absolutely crucial. And this is why I really want to, I want to suggest to everybody that you have a yoga practice it doesn't have to be extensive it doesn't have to be a it doesn't have to be a physical workout but some kind of a yoga practice where you it doesn't even have to be yoga it could be tai chi whatever it is or it could be something that's more extensively fig, uh, physical like sport running swimming whatever but um something that really allows you to get inside of your body and to feel your body that's, that in itself can be quite healing. At Nebraska Zen Center, I've been offering uh, yoga every Tuesday online from four to five. I would encourage you, if you have time to do it, do it. This is how we get out. This is how we, we, we improve our practice, by getting into our body, getting out of our heads and the excessive thoughts. The second thing, is to, and this is, this is, this is really um, central to Zen and practice, is to enter more fully into what you're doing already, right? If, you're, if your mind is loaded with thoughts, it means you're not practicing enough. 
right? We need to, and by enough, it doesn't mean you have to sit more. That's not what I mean. It doesn't mean you have to come to the temple more, although that might be helpful, but to focus more fully on what your actual present moment experience is. And that might mean concentrating more deeply, right? Letting go of those thoughts, entering more fully into Zazen. Dogen Zenji says, drop off body and mind, right? How do we do that? Focus more deeply on this very moment. Grind up your thoughts. And the third thing, the last thing I want to say about this is to have way more compassion, have way more compassion for ourselves, compassion for others. This is, this is the key ingredient. This is the universal doorway to liberation is compassion, right? To have love for ourselves, to love ourselves, to have love for others. This is the key. Um, I want to close with these uh, remarks from Zui Monkey. Dogen says, during the reign of Taiso of the Tang Dynasty, one of the ministers remarked to the emperor, quote, some people are slandering your majesty. Unquote. The emperor replied, as a sovereign, if I have virtue, I am not afraid of being slandered by people. I'm more afraid of being praised despite the lack of it. Thank you. Yeah, please, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to share. Thanks, Daishin. Yeah, Benji. So I noticed that uh, Dogen often suggests to like sit down and get to it, whether it's cold. He's got a lot of really like hard ass instructions. <laughs> get in there. I don't care if it's freezing cold. You need to wake up right now, you know, get to it. And I think that's interesting. And I don't, I haven't really noticed that so much. What's your take on getting to it, even when you're in pain, you know, just uh, obviously not to like hurt myself, but I think it's kind of inspiring to hear something like that. Right. And, and I think that's the, that's the point. It's to inspire us. It's to get us, get us up off of our, get us off, off of our butt. Uh, metaphorically speaking, and uh, quit making excuses. The mind will make a million excuses of why things are wrong or what needs to be better or why we can't do it, why we can't practice. And Dogen is just wiping out all of our excuses that we could possibly come up with. Uh, it doesn't mean we should hurt our bodies, Right. When Dogen says you got to practice no matter what, even if your body is hurting, he's not saying go and hurt your body in order to practice. He's just saying don't use that as an excuse for not practicing. Right. Don't use don't use your physical illness as an excuse for not practicing. Don't use disputes within your family as reasons for not practicing. Find a way to practice in this moment, regardless of what's happening to your body and, and mind. There's no reason for us not to practice. And my teacher would say, the only thing that's more difficult than not practicing, uh, I'm sorry, the only thing that is more difficult than practice is not practicing. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have, you know, when we're practicing, at least we have a place, we have, a, we have faith. We've got trust in the Dharma. When we're not practicing, we've given that up and we don't have anything really to, to rely on. We've lost our, when we've lost our faith, when we've lost our trust in the Dharma, uh, uh, it, we are very vulnerable to the, the pulls of, of the world, these worldly sentiments, the likes and the dislikes, the ups and downs, the blames and praises. And we just get pulled in the direction of praise. We get repelled by the direction of, of blame. It makes us very vulnerable. When we're practicing the Dharma wholeheartedly, we do our very best. And sometimes we make mistakes, we screw up, yet we get back on the horse, we keep on riding, regardless. Right? That's, that's why I do this, you know, this is why I ordained, I wanted to, you know, I don't want to make excuses anymore for my life. 
I don't I want to I, I don't want to live in a hell realm all of the time. Right. So every time, you know, I might be in a, in a hell realm, but I put on this robe and I think, no, screw that. I'm living for the Dharma. Forget forget all the thoughts that other people think of me. Forget about the thoughts that I think of myself. I am here to do my very best to serve others, to to be one with the Buddha, to enjoy, to love this life, to have love for this life. All right. That's that's my that's my practice. Whether I'm a success at that, you know, somebody else can judge that. I don't, you know. Yeah, I have a <clears throat> I have a question about Soto Zen. And I'm interested in uh, the practice of self inquiry, um, and I, I haven't seen it in Soto Zen. So this is guys like Komar Maharshi, or um, and I was aware that this is a part of the Rinzai tradition. Is who am I? And almost holding that as a koan. And uh, I was just curious if that's present in our tradition. Yeah, I think it is. It's just we take a little bit different tact or or take on it, depending on on um, what you're reading at the time or what teacher is talking about it. But I, I think of uh, I think you're right to say that there is this emphasis in other traditions about self inquiry that appears to be lacking in Soto Zen. Um, it appears that way. But I, I think if you keep studying Dogen and Soto Zen, you'll, you'll find it there too. It's not maybe right in your face, but it's there as well. I'm thinking of Genjo Koan to study the way, he says, right at the beginning. To study the way is to study the self. Right? He says right there, right at the beginning, to study the way is to study the self. But we don't end there. We don't stop there. To study the self is to forget the self. This is, this is and this is uh, Buddhism. This is Buddhism 101, that there, we might have a self, but we also have no self. Mm. This, this self is illusory. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. It, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't study the self. The self is illusory, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't study it. Therefore, you know, so we make these logical, rational thing, ideas about it. Oh, because there's no self, then I don't have to study it. No. <laughs> yeah. You have to study it to realize, to finally realize that it's illusory. I think it helps. Yeah, I think yeah. for sure. The you. more you study it, the more it's ungraspable. The more you realize that it's, you know, it's not. It's just not there in the way you thought it was. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. But what we prize to be ourself is not the self. And here's here's where I think Soto Zen can really be helpful for American culture. That is that it it abolishes this idea of of individuality actually it doesn't abolish it 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 affirms individuality and uniqueness but it balances it with unity it balances with you it with with unity that's what the meaning of the um the zen poem sandokai the harmony of difference and equality is about that the self this the self we we talk about the big self the big self includes everyone. And then there's the the little self. And actually, I want to talk more about this next time I'm there. We're, we're going to study Genjo Koan. Uh, so as we're going to we're going to get into that. That's the plan anyways, to get into Genjo Koan. This is the, 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 the right at the beginning of Genjo Koan, the, in the title itself. Um, we can see this this uh, merging of the individual with the whole. Yeah. So it's an opportunity for you guys get to, to inquire into the self, to inquire into your life, to clarify who
who we are. Absolutely. Clarify who we are and what we're about. I would just encourage all of you to, to join us for that. Again, it's going to be on the Saturday afternoon that I'm there. Yeah. I think. Is that right? You check the schedule, but anyway. Yeah, Saturday afternoon. Okay. Yeah, Max, hey. Hey, Daishin. I um, noticed that when you were reflecting on um, if we do something that we view is right and someone else views as a wrong or bad, a lot of the examples you gave were of uh, authority figures, parents, teachers, your boss. It was just sort of right at the end of the talk that you flipped that around with the sovereign who's not con uh, concerned with being slandered by um, those in his jurisdiction. I uh, was wondering if you had any thoughts about how those power dynamics influence, uh, if you have different advice for like, um, if we receive that sort of critique from uh, a parent or a boss or whatever versus like if it is your kid your student someone else who you might have some power over who is letting that critique Woof! yeah great great articulation there i don't know if i can do it justice to respond but i'll do my best here um first of all i i think when we get negative feedback or critique from authority figures or people that we that are under our supervision in some way it hurts so just to acknowledge that we're not immune to uh, some of us are more sensitive more highly sensitive to critique than others for other people it just it kind of rolls off of you like uh, water on a duck's back other people it's almost like a uh, a duck in an oil spill it just they just soak it up and take it very personally so first of all we need to we need to figure out for ourselves where we are in that spectrum of things are we highly sensitive to uh critique um and also it depends on who's giving it to us if we if we uh receive it in a, in a very sensitive and loving way from somebody that we really respect we might take it differently than if we see if we receive it harshly from somebody that we deeply respect right so it depends on the context in which we're receiving it and that the same goes for the the um those who are under our supervision if if um their critique is coming from an ego base that they're not able to see then we may not take it as seriously uh, versus uh, uh somebody that we uh see really aspiring and earnest that's under our supervision and we receive critique from that person we might take it differently so for anyways first thing is like how are we receiving it and uh what's our level of sensitivity to it uh that's going to determine what we what action we 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 take uh and i'm guessing that most of us may you know that that question might be coming from a place of of high sensitivity you know in instances of high sensitivity um i i think in either case in either case, uh, whether it's from an authority figure or from somebody who's, who's not so much, is that uh, we've got to have sincerity. Since it, it forces us to be really sincere in our practice, that we we continue to refine ourselves again and again. Keep keep going. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on the practice. You're gonna make mistakes. To acknowledge that and just to deepen, deepen, deepen. Keep keep going. All right, keep going. You can learn. Absolutely, you can learn from it, maybe. But um, uh, uh, sometimes we don't learn. Uh, or, or I should say, sometimes it takes us a long time to learn. And in any case, just keep going. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, um, to flip that around, uh, what is a way, given this, um, in this like, compassionate Buddhist context to give feedback and give critique, especially to people that we might be supervising or people in our families where the stakes are high, things like that. Uh, can, so um, can you say that in a question? I'm not sure I got the question. What is a way to give feedback? Oh, oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. 
Um, yeah, you know, I don't think there's one way, and there's probably a lot of strategies available if you've got some, you know, some self-help instructions there. I bet there's a lot of strategies. Some things that I've found helpful. Again, you have to know who you're giving feedback to. Are they highly sensitive? Or are they less so? You know, so, for example, some children are 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 really um, almost impenetrable. You, you can yell at them and they actually appreciate it because that's how they hear you. Whereas other stu other kids, uh, they they are they are super quick to get it. Uh, in in the Zen story, there's the story of the the fastest horse or the 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 not the fastest horse but the four horses. You know that story of the four horses and the whip, right? So the 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 there's the four horses. The the best horse is the horse that merely sees the shadow of the whip and it moves the cart. The second best is the horse that hears the sound of the whip, the snap of it, and it it moves. The, the, the third best horse is the one where the, the whip hits the very edge of its skin. And then the worst horse is the, the whip that has to go deep into the um, muscle of the horse for it to get it to go. Um, so which 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 horse are we dealing with here? First of all, now that sounds like a, a harsh analogy. Um, Nonin was one. I think he, you know, he he could be pretty harsh at times. Um, but we have to discriminate. We have to discriminate with who we're who we're working with. We really have to know them before we decide how to approach it. You know, I'm not suggesting we, 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 we um, do any of those for you, you have to take responsibility for that and figure that out for yourself. And talking about it with your partner, for example, if it's a child, talking about it with your partner, if that's helpful, or with a therapist might be helpful. Um, but knowing knowing your child, uh, as far as students go, same, it's not different. I don't think it's that different with students, um, with bosses too. Uh, so there's a, um, now there's a, there's a book out there, how to, how to deal with people you can't stand. <laughs> and it was made, especially for in the workplace. And the author says that there's 12, I think he makes like some 12 personality types and gives specific instructions for how to talk with different people. Like if your boss is a bully, then, then you've got to be really straightforward and upfront with them. All right. So um, Nonin, for example, if you're not in his face talking right back to him, he's not going to hear what you have to say. But not everybody is like that. I had one experience I felt really helpful um, in guidance where the, I, I knew this one, one of my uh, uh, people that I was working with wasn't going to take criticism well. And sometimes uh, what I would do is give feedback and then wait for, wait for some response. And uh, one of my teachers said, don't wait for the response, just leave. Offer the feedback and then go quickly. You know, and, and it was actually turned out to be really good advice in that situation because it didn't allow the person to um, to kind of uh, go into a negative headspace about it and, and uh, prevented it from taking it personally. So if we're if we're looking for somebody to to take it personally, then we can stick around and, and wait for their response um, and, and feed that uh, negative headspace. But if we do it quickly, you know, just say it quickly and then leave. So we're not taking what they've done personally. Actually, I just had to do that this after, this morning. There's a, um, a tenant that I've been working with at a property, a rental property, and they're leaving their junk outside, you know, and it's been sitting there for days. So I just said to, said to the tenant, I said, uh, do you need help putting this at the curbside? And uh, the person responded, and I knew they were in a really negative headspace, so I just okay, and then left. I just be real quick about it, and then go. So, anyways, that, I'm not saying that's the way to deal with everybody, 
but there, there's, there's just, we got to, this is where the practice is. This is really, Mike, this is really the heart of the practice. We got to, don't give up. Don't give up on, if, you, if, if one way doesn't work, try another way. There's multiple ways to respond to people. And we, we just got to keep, this is part of studying the self. This is also part of studying the self. Yeah. It's all practice. It is all Dharma, right? Don't give up. There's no one else. Yeah, thank you guys. I see some new fo folks there too. Thank you all for for uh, joining us. It's been a pleasure. I hope to see you when I see you when I'm in there in a couple of weeks. Please come too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks, Arjun. So many beings are numberless, bowing to carry them across. Love me, beings are numberless, bowing to carry them across. Greed, anger, and ignorance rise endlessly, bowing to cut off the mind road. going to ask Tara. I think Tara put a posted a new schedule of events for June on the um, on the court board in the entryway. Uh, so we have a lot of activities coming up with Daishin's weekend and the 16th through the 18th. Um, and I'd like to thank the people who helped uh, for work day yesterday. Thank you, Doug. And Joyce was here and uh, uh, Amelia and Eric did some painting around the place, so that was very good. We'll have an, another work day sometime in July. I don't know if we've set a date, but um, so uh, that'll be something to mark on your calendars. Uh, anything else I'm forgetting? Anybody? Probably. Take a look at the schedule on the work board if you want to know what's coming up. That's all I have. Oh, uh, yeah, we do have two uh, newcomers. Uh, Shavilla signed up as a member recently, Great. and this is her first visit. And what? Rizvi. 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 Her husband. Yeah, is, is with her. So thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming. In interest. We have a good uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, we are very happy to uh, be part of this community. Uh, we are new to Omaha. We are from Sri Lanka. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Welcome, welcome. Um, so we'll have tea and conversation afterward in the community room. And uh, Benji's going to have to drink a lot of coffee because he, he made a lot of coffee. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's put our cushions back and then we'll bow out.
Hey, take care, everyone. Have a good uh, coffee and conversation. Yeah. Sit down. Bye bye. I saw the website that we a big snow over. I saw it in June, I read. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to.